All right, very good. Um, I am going to uh, I'm going to play for you something I think is very significant, and uh, Jody's getting this ready for us. Uh, I keep reminding you that there that there are a lot of things that are going on in our society around us, and you and I have an opportunity to have some influence related to not just our, our kids, but our grandkids and great-grandkids. If you are not aware, there is a civil war going on in the United States of America, and this war is over the soul of our nation. And it's every bit as much a war as the Civil War in the 1860s was. And uh, the, the future of our country and the freedom of Christianity to function in our country is at stake. And uh, I want to just play this little short clip. There is a website I would really urge you to go to, and then you're going to want to share it with other people. It's called Prager University. It's free. It deals with many of the issues that are at stake. And you need to be aware of what's going on. And so the question that's being raised in this one is, are humans more valuable than animals? Now, I know many of you have pets that you love. We have a cat that we love. I'm so delighted she chases the gophers out of our yard over in Florence. And it's fantastic because she's an outside cat. But there's something much bigger at stake in this issue because I can guarantee you that your grandchildren and great-grandchildren do not realize the vital significance about human value. Just watch this for a minute. I think that will bless you. You guys want to shut the other lights off? Are you more valuable than a dog, or a cat, or for that matter, a tree? One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Our secular, post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Why? There are two reasons. One is that with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth over that of an animal. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked 
their lives to save the woman's three cats. If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. In fact, many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they call class enemies. Individual human life meant nothing. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers and mountains are. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. I'm Dennis Prater. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click here. To help keep our videos free, donate here. I do believe that it's uh, worthy of our time for you to be aware there are some tools like this that you can disseminate out to your, uh, to your kids and to your uh, grandkids and great-grandkids so that they can understand what's going on. This is not to say you can't love your animals. Uh, at the funeral I did in Colorado here just recently, the lady <coughs> that I've been friends with for several years said, be sure to read the scripture about the horses. Well, she believes horses are going to be in heaven. And I read the passage at the graveside service where Jesus rides in on a white stallion. So yes, they will be there. But you need to understand that we are of infinite value in the eyes of God. And there's no human being throughout human history who's ever been created that's exactly like you. We were reading in uh, Psalm, Bob, where was that, 139? 139. Psalm 139. He said, God, David said of himself, God knew me when I was formed in my mother's womb. Yes. And so this is a war that's going on, and we need to do what we can to help influence. I look at my grandkids, and I know that they're being taught, and I hear things out of their mouths where things in the uh, earth around us are more valuable than humans. And it's a lie. We are of the greatest value. Now, we've got responsibilities. God gave us responsibilities to care for the things around us. The Bible says that a righteous man is kind even to his animals. And that's absolutely true. But a dog drowning and a stranger drowning, I hope there's no question in your mind as to who it is that you would attempt to say, hopefully the dog will, dog will make it, but I'm going to give the human the help there. I think it's a terrible indictment of the influence of many subversive teachings that are going on, and they like to go under the radar so that we don't hear what's being taught, and then we see the influence and the infection that it has. So I encourage you to go to Prager University. It doesn't cost anything. If you go to the videos, uh, he deals with a lot of different things, but you'll see one that says, uh, that says uh, religion and philosophy. And there are a whole bunch of these that can really be helpful in a very succinct manner to address some of these uh, issues. One of my favorite I've played here, uh, he uh, 
is presented, actually Dennis Prager doesn't do most of the videos. It's done by a professor of philosophy at Boston College, and in seven or eight minutes he makes the rational argument for why it is more rational to believe in God than to be an atheist. And you can see that in seven or eight minutes, so there's an opportunity for you. Well, we're delighted that you're here. Our main purpose of gathering, of course, is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and to turn our attention to Him. So would you stand with me as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. from our ancestors 
that, Lord, you call us out of that into light. And your mercy is so great. You forgive us for all our wrong as we forgive those who've wronged us. So today, Jesus, we're here to say that we do love you. And we bless you for your affection you set on us. Not that we were deserving or worthy. But Lord, you made us worthy because of what you did. And thank you that your blood cleanses us of our ungodliness and sin so that we can relate to holy God. Thank you that you died on the cross to remove from us the curses of the law because of our disobedience. And for the knowledge that by your stripes, by your wounds, you bought physical healing for us. And we've been eyewitnesses to you performing these miraculous healings in people right in this room here. And God, we just recognize that it's you. We thank you for your love toward us. Receive our humble effort today to honor and worship you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Do be seated. Ron's going to come leave. had uh, the uh, Pandora on, on some praise music and a song came across and um, it uh, touched me really deep. Uh, we weren't in a very hopeful place. Uh, my wife had decided uh, she already had chemotherapy and radiation once and it's not a very good option this time. And uh, the song came on, which brought comfort, uh, because it told us what has to happen in our lives at different times uh, when we you know, either come to Jesus, or sing to Jesus, or fall on Jesus, or cry to Jesus, or dance for Jesus. Or fly to Jesus. And uh, on Monday, I thought we were flying to Jesus. We went to the uh, the oncologist the next day, and they told us the things we didn't really expect. Maybe, probably, it's the prayer. They told us. Um, this thing that she has in her head uh, that was there five, six years ago. She said, we don't think that's cancer. <laughs> we think that might be due to <laughs> not so good radiation, necrosis. That doesn't sound right. That's not cancer. Yeah, she's got a cancer in her lung, a bad player too. But they said, you know, this cancer in your lung, it hasn't gone anywhere. We don't think it's gone to your liver. We don't think it's gone to your bone. At least not right here. Hasn't gone to your brain. Hasn't gone to your liver. Hasn't gone to your kidneys. It's contained. And I think, we think, there's a 30% chance that we can cure you. Come to Jesus and 
and crawl at home. And since I've been here, it's not leaking anymore. <laughs> And after the first song and the tears, I got rid of it. Amen. And we're back with it. But this is the place to be. Amen. This is the place to be when you're down and you're out. Amen. Not when you you should be here. You think you should be here, but when you're down and out, this is it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rick, for sharing that. And uh, one of the a couple, two things that it's important for us as as we pray. You know, there are a lot of there's a lot of false teaching about healing. That's why for most of my life I ran the other direction when people talked about praying earnestly and seriously and laying down hands on as Jesus prescribed and anointing people with oil and praying. I've seen it merchandise. I've seen the abuses. And uh, th but this is for real. This is this is not pretend. And so we're always asking, how do you feel? I saw uh, Lee was back today. We prayed for Lee's knee a couple of weeks ago. And she was doing better. She's a little sore today. I told her it was probably because she was running so much last night in her dreams that her knee was falling off. But um, two things I need to tell you about Dr. Rick's wife, Denise, uh, that we rejoiced about on Wednesday night. One is, since we started praying for her, she's not coughing up blood anymore. That's a, that's a huge, huge progress indicating the Lord has already begun to heal her body. But the second thing that some of you can appreciate if you've ever lost your sense of smell and taste. For five years, she has not had a sense of smell or taste until last Sunday night, Saturday night, when you guys got back from New York. She can taste food again for the first time in five years. I hope that you can grasp today. I, you know, we have a variety of backgrounds that people are from, and and we're not trying to turn you into anything except one who walks with Jesus. But I just want you to know we're not playing church here. We're learning to connect with the living God, Amen. and when we connect with the living God, it's for real. Amen. And life and death decisions we can go to Him with, and bumps and bruises and aches and pains along the way we can go to Him with. And He intervenes in our behalf. And for that reason, we are compelled to worship Him and sing to Him. Amen. Now we dim the lights so that maybe you can just focus on your heart and Jesus as we sing together. And I'm going to ask you to work on your worship muscles by standing, if you would. Some of you, some of you can't stand, that's okay. You're not going to be ostracized for that. I offended somebody one day because some of us were lifting our hands and the fellow thought I was looking right at him to embarrass him that he wasn't lifting his hands. Mm -hmm. that, that's a bunch of religious crap. Can I tell you? Okay. You're free in Jesus. Okay. You're, you're free in Jesus. And you know, if you need to dance or shout or you, you just be yourself and just focus on the Lord as we sing to him. This is the air I breathe.
this is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. Yo 
saved at the name of Jesus. We can be healed at the name of Jesus. Relationships can be restored. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are giving your name to us as we walk with you.
his thoughts and philosophies can reach. Jesus, to know that by your spirit, you would come to live inside us. Yes. Cause us to live in a wonderful place. Doesn't mean we won't have problems and trials because you promised us in the world we'll have tribulations. But you told us, Lord, to take courage, be of good cheer, because you've overcome the world. And you've overcome the flesh that we struggle with. And you've overcome Satan and the powers of darkness. God, grant us more wisdom and understanding about all that you send and give to us. Thank you, Jesus. I ask you now, come, Lord. Be our teacher. We have no need, the Bible says, for any man to be our teacher. Lord, may we learn how to learn from you. Speak to us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Do be seated. God bless you. singing in the choir in college twice I got to go to the Phoenix Symphony Hall to hear her sing with the choir there and so forth but you know what I've heard very skilled and very talented singing it's empty and hollow because it's just a mechanical experience but I don't know about you but I really sense that today wasn't mechanical you weren't just going through the motions and God bless you for your contribution in that because you know I'm, I'm in this building a lot when nobody's here and the ceiling fans and light fixtures and carpet and pews don't sing to the Lord. <laughs> okay, they don't. He doesn't live here. He lives here. And the reason he comes in such a powerful way here is because you brought him with you as you came in. Wow, Linda, wasn't that awesome today? We could have just, uh, we could just sing the rest of the time. The Lord's just so strong on you. <laughs> That's awesome. Touch from the Lord. By the way, we're not presumptuous about that. The Lord doesn't have to show up here because there's a sign out front that says church. He comes if our hearts are really seeking Him. And I, and I know that many of you are, maybe maybe virtually everybody here. I Personally, I'd say if you weren't moved today as we heard testimonies and singing and sharing and praying, you might check your pulse. Uh, you may have a problem we're going to start out Matthew 12 today it was on the sign out there in case you happen to notice it Matthew chapter 12 we learned so much the last couple of weeks over uh, John chapter 4 where Jesus speaking to the woman at the well and he shared with the woman at the well the lady whose life was a mess whose heart had been broken and trampled on by, by men and by the world and Jesus told her something directly that he did not tell any other human being, at least not as is recorded in Scripture. And she went and most of the town turned to Jesus because of one young woman whose heart and life was a wreck. Did you see God's in the business of taking wrecks and fixing them? It's those who don't know their lives and, and uh, hearts are wreck that Jesus can't help. When he was being criticized by the religious people, as he always was, for hanging around with the, uh, with the sinners, Jesus said to them, it's not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are ill. And of course, they went away saying, we don't need a doctor, we're healthy. The reality was, 
that the religious leaders were sicker than the people Jesus was hanging with. They were just blind to it. They had such a high opinion of themselves because of their religiosity and religious traditions. Jesus couldn't do anything for them. He works with those that know that need Him. Those that know that they need Him. Jesus has given some important instruction here in Matthew chapter 12. And we're actually going to be looking at this for a few weeks. Um, those of you that are uh, going to be traveling and not be here, you can go to the church's website that's listed in the book for you. And you, uh, within a, usually within a week or so after a meeting, you can go and, and you can keep up to date with what we're doing. A request has been made from our Tuesday night Bible study that we uh, do live Skyping on YouTube. And we may look into that. We might have to buy some little better equipment in order to be able to do that. But we do want you to stay in touch with what the Lord's showing us. And when you come back, we want you to share what the Lord's been teaching you. We don't have a franchise on Him. He is Lord God Almighty. But He does search throughout the whole world, seeking those whose hearts are set on Him, that He may strongly support them. And He's found some of us here in the edge of the desert in Queen Valley, Arizona. And you're a part of that. But Jesus has given some important instruction that probably anybody who's gone to church very much or read the Bible very much recognizes this. But my question is, do we really believe something if we don't guard ourselves and practice what it says? A number of years ago, you know, I haven't been raised a, a, a Baptist. Uh, it was kind of funny that I was invited... <laughs> for four weeks uh, on Sunday nights, two hours a night, to teach on healing to an Assembly of God church. What I discovered in some of you who were raised Assembly of God that are here today, you, you can appreciate this. They say they believe in praying for the sick and believe in healing. My question to them really ended up being, I know you say that, but you don't do it, so do you really believe it? Or do you just give lip service to it? And of course, the problem is that a lot of people don't realize that without the truth of God's Word, faith cannot be engendered and grown in your heart and in your life. Because faith doesn't come from testimonies of people who've been healed. And I have to tell you, we have some folks here that have had some phenomenal healings. I mean, people that walk now that had to use walkers or wheelchairs. Uh, people who had paralysis who've been touched, and, and their body started tingling for, you know, Jody's case it was three weeks, and she can run for the first time in her, her 28 years. God is doing some phenomenal things. But probably more phenomenal than that is the things that God is doing in people's hearts. Yeah. And, and, but you see, God gives those signs and wonders to confirm this Word. But this Word is the authority. And until we get the truth from this word implanted in here, we're not really going to walk in things that we say that we believe. It's so nice of Jody that uh, that she's walking today. Jody, Jody's walking by. That's Jody. Because <coughs> when you're not here, and she's going from the office because she's our administrative assistant, and goes to the back, and I'll peek out the door, and she'll run right through here. She's making up for 28 years of not being able to run because. Because God is healing that paralysis there. But you see in this Assembly of God group, most of them could not name more than three or four verses of Scripture about healing. And we read and studied somewhere around 400 verses of Scripture about healing. And when it was over, God healed some of the people that were in the Assembly of God church. It was awesome. And that's not to demean them at all. It's just to make this point. Do we really believe something if we're not practicing it? We're not putting it into action. And so Jesus makes this statement that's probably not startling to you. In Matthew 12, verse 34, and in this case now, he's not calling all of us a bunch of snakes, you brood of vipers. He was addressing the religious leaders because they were accusing him of doing the miraculous, powerful things he was doing by Satan's power. She's always watching out for me. Thank you. Oh, see? She just hopped. She didn't run. <laughs> He's showing off. That's right. Showing off on Jesus. That's right. 
And so here to these religious leaders, he calls them a bunch of snakes. You brood of vipers, how can you, verse 34, being evil, speak what is good? And then Jesus speaks this eternal truth. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So, when we open our mouth, it's revealing to people around us as well as ourselves what's hidden inside. Now, that's the reason a lot of us, when we went to church through the years, where you know we wanted duct tape over our mouth because we didn't want people to know what was inside there so that we could go through the ceremonies and everything. We really didn't want people to know some of the things that were lurking in our hearts. And see, that's where we learn, many of us, to put on this religious mask and everything. And Ken, I just uh, appreciate so much you just being so open and transparent. He was having a crappy day. Things were not going very good this week. You know what? Among God's people, we can be honest. Amen. So we know how to help each other. Amen. You know, in the old days, and I've confessed this, my wife and I, we drive, you know, into the church. I've been teaching and preaching now for over 46 years. And uh, started when I was in high school. But I learned how, boy, when the handle of the door opens in the church parking lot and you set that foot out, bing, you got it. It's gone. Life is wonderful. Never had a problem in the world. Oh, my wife and I, we just have this great relationship. Aren't our kids wonderful? They never do anything to disappoint us. Lie, lie, lie. And some of us were better at it than others. But, but you see, sometimes... Sometimes we're, we, we really want to be careful because we don't, people, we don't want people to see what's in here. Jesus said, when what comes out of your mouth is going to reveal what's there. And then he says in verse 35, the good man out of his good treasure brings forth what's good. The evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. I want you to notice that Jesus Christ says there are good people and there are evil people. You're going, wow, Rick, great revelation. Now, you need to understand, in our American society today, because of the pervasive influence of the intellectual community, they've been teaching people now for 40 years that there is no such thing as evil. It's all just relative and a matter of your perspective. Let me tell you what, poor Jesus thought that there were people who were evil. By the way, there's a couple of pretty good Prager University videos about whether or not evil really exists. And the interesting thing is that for those who don't recognize evil and won't acknowledge that there's evil, they always attack the people who are fighting evil. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Do you know that President Reagan was lampooned and mocked and still is today for calling communism the evil empire? <laughs> uh, I had a lady one time who got ticked off at me she, she went to this church in, in our town in Colorado that you know quit teaching the Bible years ago. And they really hated us because we really believed and taught the Bible. And, uh, and one day she said to me, well, what is a communist anyway? And uh, at that moment, it wasn't really appropriate for me to give an answer. But let me, tell you what, let me tell you what the answer is. It's a governmental system that wants to be God and drive God out of people's lives and... It slaughtered more people in the last century than any other form of government in human history. Amen. Actually did far more damage than Nazism did, than fascism did. And nobody knows for sure how many. Stalin was, was uh, guilty of four or five times as many deaths as Hitler was. But isn't it interesting that we always think of Hitler as the worst? I just want you to know whether you know it or not, you have been influenced by some people suppressing <coughs> the truth. Not saying that any, don't take any, don't lighten the load at all on Hitler. I believe God has a special place of torment for people like him. But Stalin actually killed more people, but most of us don't know that. By the way, that's part of the reason that Ronald Reagan was relegated to, uh, to B-movies after a while. Because he dared to stand up and say, we've got to fight against communism when he was the head of the Screen Actors Guild. And once that happened, 
and he's in movies with monkeys and things like that. So there's a lot that's going on around us that we need to quit being naive. We need to open our eyes and see. And, uh, you know, for those of you that, that don't know anything about this, it's not just that I'm a fan of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan's mother had the gift of healing. The biblical gift of healing. Her church did not believe in praying for the sick. <laughs> so people would come privately to her house and from other communities, and she would lay hands on and pray for them, and they would be healed. So Ronald Reagan knew a thing or two about the power of God. Whether or not he followed that his life or not, you know, it's hard for us to know because someone's out there like that. But see, God's got people in all kinds of places, and sometimes in the most likely of circumstances. What comes out of the mouth reveals what's in the heart. And what's in the heart, if it's good, it's going to be good things that come out. Jesus went on from there, and this is the part that I, I want to challenge you about because you've perhaps heard this before, but I just want to challenge you whether or not you're, you're really believing what Jesus said because listen to what He says next. Verse 36. And I say to you, that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, Jesus Christ says you'll be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. We're going to read later, we're not going to get to it today, but we're going to read later a scripture that says, you know, let your words be few. <laughs> because we are going to render account for everything that we say. So we need to recognize that our words reveal what's here, but it also has an impact on people out there. That's why those that are in the business of merchandising and marketing things, that's why they want to get you to talk about their product, because the words coming out of your mouth influence the people around you. And so... This principle of us having influence on others by our words, God put that in place long before they ever had marketing programs, okay? But that's also why Jesus said that we need to tell of His wonderful works. And some of you go, gosh, you know, we've heard this before. You know what? You're going to hear it again when we talk about the great things that God is doing. And we're saying that to encourage you to realize God's might and power is great enough that whatever you're faced with, He can take care of that as well. He may not do it in exactly the same way. In our, in our study, where, uh, we had our, our Bible conference where we studied uh, 467 verses about physical healing from the Bible, which is not all of them. It's a pretty good sampling of them. But we found that it, every time Jesus healed people, He did it a little bit differently. But He gave a few guidelines. And one of the guidelines is lay hands on people. And, then, and I know you folks from the Midwest, you've got that, that real moral strength and humility ingrained in you that says, well, I don't want to be a bother. Oh, no, God's got more things. Let me tell you what. His power and resources are great enough. You know, he's, he even has counted the number of hairs on my head. And it's fewer now than it was, you know, a year ago. And a lot fewer than it was a few years ago. His accounting system and His resources are great enough. If you give just a cup of water in His name, He'll bless you for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're not being a burden. But you have to be willing to come the way God says. Here, God says, here's how I'm going to heal you. You're going to gather around, lay hands on someone and pray for them. And sometimes we anoint people with oil. That, by the way, that's not the only instruction we have about praying for the sick. But we do keep a little vial that has uh, frankincense and myrrh in it there. And, there's nothing magic about the oil because the power is in God. But we're just showing our obedience to Him. There are a lot of interesting things. You know, I've mentioned the couple in Craig, Colorado that had spent the money to have in vitro fertilization done. They were unsuccessful. The medical field said, sorry, you know, it was tried twice. It's not going to work. And we wanted, uh, they asked us to pray that they would be able to have kids. And we weren't getting anywhere in our praying. See, and that's where we have to learn how to hear what God's saying. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, that I mentioned again, then the Lord gave us word of knowledge. We sang a praise song, we marched around them seven times, like the walls of Jericho, and then we laid hands on and prayed for them, and they now have two children. Uh, 
it's, it's not a magic formula. It's a matter of, God, what do we need to do? And so learning how to hear His voice is so important. And then what we should be speaking out of our mouth should be His, His words, His truth. We need... We, we've become very flippant about throwing out our advice to people, you know. Oh, gosh, you know, I have this problem. Here's what you need to do. Well, at least three other couples that we prayed for that have kids now that couldn't have them, we never once again did that thing of marching around them seven times. So, see, we need to be on guard that with our words. We say, oh, this is what you got to do, and then it'll work. Well, no, what you have to do is connect with God. What is the Lord saying to do? And so we need to be on guard that we're not laying our opinions on people and cutting off what the Lord has to say. We were reading earlier today in the Bible study class where, uh, where Jesus said, I do the things I see my Father doing. I say the things I hear my Father say. So I guess I would just urge you today as we start to investigate this about our words, uh, we're going to read verses that says, Life and death are in the power of the... Huh, Jesus just told us by your words you'll be justified by your words you'll be condemned it's, it's a very serious thing this thing about our words and it's one of the easiest things that we give away all the time we just give it away all the time advice, words, ideas and sometimes we speak out and we're throwing a wet blanket on people and sometimes we see someone discouraged and when we speak God's word it lifts them up God has given us that power as human beings the question is, are we using it according to His purposes? Or do we just fall habitually into those habits of this is what we always say? You know, it, it always used to annoy me. Uh, now, if you have a habit of this, I, I'm not aware of it. I'm not picking on you. But, you know, if the shoe fits where? You know? Okay. Hey, working hard or hardly working? Oh. There's nothing, there's nothing more annoying and demeaning to somebody that's in the middle of doing something than somebody making fun of what level of energy they're exerting to do something. See, I'm telling you, we have habits of saying these things that are like barbs poking people. And that's why Jesus said, see, do you notice when he said this? Look at this one more time before we go. Verse 36. But I say to you that every careless uh, some translations say idle. Every idle word that men speak, they'll render account for it. How much more when you're under oath or you take a vow or you make some kind of a commitment um, or you say to some place, I will, you know, I'm obliged to do this, I'll, I'll do this. It says, certainly we're expected to keep our word and when we're giving testimony in a and, uh, you know, someone's future is hanging in the balance. But you see, what he's saying here is not just the important words, not just the agreements that you make with other people, but even the careless, idle words that you throw out there, you're going to actually render account for. By the way, one of those words you'll render account for is whether or not you have publicly acknowledged Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen. So I went to church. I've already done that. Well, have you really? Because actually Jesus says to us in Matthew 10, He says, if you confess me before men, then I'll confess you before my Father and all the angels of heaven. And that's why normally at the end of the service, most of the time we give people an opportunity to come and to confess Jesus before men. We also give people an opportunity to say, I need a touch from God. I'm hurting today. Would you pray for me? And see, we don't have a, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have a, oh, here we go. We'll pour the healing out on you. No, no. We're just learning to connect with the living God. And when we connect with Him, all of His resources are available for us. Mm -hmm. Folks, this isn't about playing games and ceremonies. Jesus isn't interested in ceremonies. He's interested in your heart. Mm -hmm. And when we connect with Him, all of His resources are available for us. Mm -hmm. Would you stand with me as we pray?
Lord Jesus, thank you for your sweet presence that's been here with us today. Just like in the Bible, Jesus, every time someone encountered you, their attitude, their heart, their motives, their conduct was changed. And Lord, likewise, when we come to worship and we really do encounter you, we are changed for the better. <laughs> All change isn't necessarily good, but this is good change, Jesus, by what you do for us. You cause us to be humble. You cause us, Lord, to be merciful toward those who've wronged us. You cause us to forgive people who've wronged us. And you give us the opportunity to spread the love of God to everyone we encounter. So, Lord, thank you for that today. Lord, these are your people here. The sheep of your pasture. And maybe some of them have needs today. So I ask you to move on their hearts. Perhaps if there's some who've never confessed and said, I, I want to declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, just like you told us to. And God, help them today to make the choice to do. In these moments, if you have a need, I welcome you to come. Be seated here on the front row. We'll ask some folks to pray with you and ask the Lord Jesus to touch you today. Or if maybe you've never publicly confessed Jesus, let me tell you, you won't find a more friendly and welcoming group than are here for you to come and say, I've taken Jesus into my life and I want to declare him as Lord. So as Linda plays, you need to confess Jesus. This is your opportunity. Come. And we'll pray with you and rejoice with you. If you're hurting today and you need uh, to be prayed for and ask Jesus to touch you, come and be seated on the front rows. So we wait just a few moments for you. Amen. Anyone else that needs to come? Anyone else step out from where you are? Just come and be seated right here at the front. As we're waiting on Jesus and a touch from Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God's been touching you and drawing you, and you come. And we'll ask the Lord to come and give you a touch here today. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. You're on the front. Anyone else? take seriously that admonition that we are going to render even account for the careless words we speak. God, may our mouths be guarded and may it reflect a change in our heart that we're being careful about what we say. Sometimes the best thing we can do, Jesus, is like you did in front of the council who were making all those false accusations where the scripture says you made the good confession and your good confession was you said nothing at all. Pilate was amazed because, Lord, you were commending yourself to God the Father. Thank you, Lord, for these that have come here and we ask you to minister to each one. Thank you for every person that you brought in our gathering here today, Jesus. And we ask you to minister to every one of these needs. And again, we thank you for safe travel for those that are going to be going across the roads. We pray today in Jesus.